Welcome to Elevating Consciousness, the podcast that helps you discover deeper levels of truth, meaning, and wholeness. I'm your host, Artem Zen, and our guest today is a process facilitator, integration support counselor, and a doctoral candidate focusing on medical anthropology and cultural psychiatry. He's the director of therapy and integration at Reprecision Health, a retreat center on the Pacific coast of Mexico. He's also the co-founder and CEO of Hidden Hand Media, a creative agency in the space of transformation and technology. He has spent close to five years living and working in the Peruvian Amazon, facilitating workshops and ayahuasca retreats while conducting extensive field work and research in collaboration with the International Center for Ethnobotanical Education, Beckley Foundation, and more recently, the Center for Psychedelic Research at Imperial College, where he is currently a visiting student. Adam Aronovich, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so I'd love to begin with just, uh, if you could share with us the work you're doing in medical anthropology and cultural psychiatry, what are these fields about and what are the fundamental questions you're seeking to answer or contribute to? That's a great question um, and very broad too. I think, you know, in a, in a nutshell, medical anthropology and cultural psychiatry are both ways of looking at certain things from a broader a more comprehensive uh, lens in this case in my in my in my case for example uh is mental health yeah like i've been i've been in the field of mental health for many years uh my background is in psychology i worked in psychiatric environments for a very long time and uh, at some point, I wanted to try and understand emotional suffering and psychological distress from a lens that is broader than the one that is afforded by the, on one hand, the biomedical professions, and on the other hand, uh, approaches that are, um, you know, both kind of like reliant on psychopharmacology as the main tool, but also that it considered um, human suffering and distress in a very narrow way. That is, in, I mean, in a sense that I perceive to be very individualistic and very detached from the actual context in which with human lives unfold. You know, the relationality aspect of it, our community, uh, society, culture, environment, and so on and so forth. So, you know, trying to locate suffering and emotional distress not exclusively in the brains of people but rather in the relationships between people and all the other uh, broader layers of interbeing um cultural psychiatry is a way of mental suffering in a in a broader sense not necessarily only through the lens of like the ethnocentric western way of doing psychiatry, but how other cultures and other people in different parts of the world understand uh, distress, understand mental suffering, understand mental illness and mental well-being, and what it is that we can learn from them. Yeah, like the, um, the biomedical professions of the Western world in general, but psychiatry very particularly, have a tendency to try and universalize everything as if our insights applied to every person in this world, regardless of what their background is, or regardless of what their uh, cultural or social setup is like. And that's not always the case. You know, there are many things that we take for granted as being intrinsic to human beings and intrinsic to the way that human beings suffer in this world that is actually um, not universal, right? It's uh, very specific to the way that we live our lives in Western westernized countries. So that's kind of like in a nutshell, uh, the things that we deal with and what I'm trying to answer in particular from my perspective uh, again I, I mean I you know I started in psychiatric environments dealing mostly or trying to help people that were diagnosed with psychotic disorders so for many years I worked mostly with people that were diagnosed with schizophrenia uh, like heavy duty really in my view um you know, entail some of the worst experiences of suffering that I've encountered in people. And I also very quickly realized that we don't really have answers for them. We don't really understand what madness is, what uh, what does it mean to experience the world in such a different way, or at least in a way that diverges so much from our social constructs and our narrow definitions of what, what is normal and what is sane. 
And the way that we deal mostly with these uh, ex experiences is by first and foremost tagging them as abnormal, as aberrant, and then medicating people in a way to try and put them back in line, or at the very least, kind of like trying trying to um, fix their experience so it conforms more to what we define should be a normal experience. Instead of understand what their experience, see how societies so they don't feel as excluded as, as lonely and as alienated as oftentimes the case is when people have to be either heavily medicated or put in a uh, inpatient ward or so on and so forth so uh yeah i wanted to find out if there are better ways of actually helping people that don't entail the kinds of exclusionary treatments that oftentimes we afford people that have having these experiences um but you know that applies for everything else i think depression anxiety different ways of dealing with trauma um again like there's there's many things that we can learn parts of the world and under different circumstances and different societies have dealt with different kinds of suffering and emotional suffering that i think uh could give us you know ways of also for ourselves for our societies for the people that are suffering in our communities to be able to deal with these things in a better way. I think for all of our technological advancements and theoretical prowess and resources, uh, for the most part, Western societies tend to deal um, in a non-optimal way with emotional distress and human suffering. In many ways, um, one of the we have some of the worst mental health outcomes in the whole world. Yeah. Yeah, so... I'm assuming that this interest is what brought you to psychedelics. Um, and I'm just kind of curious how that fits in and how what if there's any insights that you've been gaining from your work of like, how what do we need to do to switch uh, our approach to mental health and to helping people dealing with uh, illness or just this ease in its various forms? Yeah, I mean, psychedelics were definitely a doorway in many ways for me to start thinking differently about things, both for my personal life, but also my professional life. Um, and, you know, kind of getting some insights about what it is that actually people need to feel better. Um, you know, in my personal experience, psychedelics were important because they allowed me to reframe and reconfigure my own experience in all sorts of different ways. Uh, I got really interested in what the therapeutic potential of these substances uh, is or can be uh, way earlier before it became as fancy and fashionable as it is today. You know, we're talking about maybe 15, 20 years ago where this discourse wasn't mainstream still. And I think, you know, for, for many of us, um, the first few times that we had those experiences, it became very obvious that there was something in it that was not only personally valuable, but also socially valuable and culturally valuable, uh, particular people that have been working in mental health. So, you know, when it comes to psychedelics, I think from, you know, my personal perspective nowadays, it's very different than what it used to be even five years ago. Um, my personal perspective is that psychedelics are very valuable insofar as we're not using them again as a psychopharmaceutical agent to individualize and compartmentalize disease but rather as a doorway to start understanding the interconnectedness of things and you know the way that psychedelics for example are used in traditional societies is very different because it's always embedded within ritual and ceremony and social relationships and the way that people understand mental illness and mental health and mental well-being and distress and all of these things is always also interrelational, right? So, you know, my perspective this is kind of like already um, the main insight in a nutshell. But I think like the main thing that really I would like to communicate or the main thing that I'm trying to uh, voice in most of my work and communication is precisely this idea, right? That, um, you know, if we really want people to be healthier and happier we need to expand our perspective of what it means to be happy and healthy not necessarily in a hyper individualistic way of trying to fix certain parts of our brains or, or trying to fix certain aspects of the lifestyle of individual people but understanding the relationships amongst things you know, like in in the case of traditional societies for example um you know, when a person feels sad or when a person experiences despair or when a person experiences worry, 
it's very rare that somebody is going to come to them and be like, oh, like you, you know, there must be some problem with your neurotransmitters and right. your synapses, or there's maybe some chemical imbalance and you must be feeling sad because something is broken in your brain, or you must be feeling anxious because um, whatever, you don't have good, you know, cognitive coping skills and you're thinking about things wrong. It's much more likely people are going to start asking questions about that person's life, right? Like, well, what's happening in your relationships? What's happening with your work? What's happening with your family? And try to locate the sources of sadness or, or worry or whatever it is within the immediacy of what that person is going through, which is something that we almost have forgotten how to do for ourselves. Right? We try to think, well, yeah, of course, there's an epidemic of depression because there's all sorts of things happening in our societies and all sorts of things happening in our world that are cause for a deep sadness and deep despair in a lot of people. Of course, we have epidemics of anxiety running through, you know, millennials and younger people um, because there's many reasons to be worried about outcomes for that particular generation. You know, I mean, a person my age nowadays in most parts of the post-industrial world, it's very difficult for us to think, for example, of whatever owning property or having the kind of economic security that we would need to not having to have existential anxiety. So, well, what's going to happen in two years or three years if I lose my job or if I don't save enough money or, you know, in the U.S., it's even worse i mean you're you're always you're always two months unemployment away from homelessness you're one medical emergency away from bankruptcy i mean of course people are anxious because the social conditions uh, you know the cultural and political zeitgeist are driving us towards kind of that existential worry because we're not able to find the sort of security that people in other societies or other cultures would find within smaller tribal setups right like if you're living in a tribe if in the rainforest which is where I spent many years, um, you know, the worry that you're ever going to lose your place in society is not really relevant because no matter what happens, there's always kind of like that commitment towards mutual responsibility, reciprocity, people taking care of each other. You know, that's completely lost in most of the North American cultures, at least. So it's kind of like a, an expanded eye, bird eyes, um, expanded um bird view of these things uh but in a general sense i think the point really is that we, we need to start looking at mental distress and emotional distress and all of these things more seriously within the structures or just as well as we are within the individuals and start understanding why people are being you know why we're driving these epidemics of this of anxiety of depression what's happening and so on and so forth yeah um there's a lot there. It's, it's fascinating overview. Um, I'm curious if you've ever heard of uh, interpersonal neurobiology. I have heard the term. I haven't gone deep into that. But yes, yes that, that I like the sound of that for sure. Yeah. So like what you're saying to me, that kind of reflects the idea that, you know, in, interpersonal neurobiology, it's like this multidisciplinary field that really studies the mind and mental health. And, um, you know, it's been created through mostly through Dan Siegel's efforts and he's put uh, Dr. Dan Siegel and he's put together, he's brought together a lot of um, other, other doctors and a lot of people in various fields to kind of try to understand what the mind is. Right. And their understanding is that, that the mind creates itself through, uh, through the body and relationships. So it's the interaction. So the mind is not just inside or outside out there it's in between and it's through it's everywhere and it, we're all interconnected in it and we're actually regulating ourselves and our mental health whether it's you know improving our mental health or making it worse through our relationships so i think a lot of what you're saying is being reflected like in this multidisciplinary field uh but you are saying that still this dominant uh, psychiatric model like very DSM kind of driven. This is what you got. This is what's wrong with you. Let's give you uh, just some medication because there's something wrong with your serotonin levels. Right. It's just, yeah, it's like this very, um, I, guess, I guess it's like this very, um, um, it, it's it's very like a left brain driven approach. Like we're just going to, we're going to put something in you and you're going to be fine or we're going to take something out and it's going to be fine. It's not seeing this the whole picture in the in the bigger context. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, like one of the insights of medical anthropology or the originating insight of medical anthropology is that medical systems are not independent from cultural systems. But like medical systems or the way that we understand uh, illness and health and so on and so forth and the way we both diagnose, treat uh, and so on and so forth are intertwined with our ontology. You know, what's our worldview? How, what do we... How do we see the world? What are the players in the world? What exists in the world? What is the social organization in the world? And so on and so forth. Yeah, so the, the medical systems that you're describing are emergent in many ways from the underlying ideologies that permeate our societies. And they're, they're, they're always going to be linked to that. And it's not only about the way that we perceive uh, like, like the physicalism of it, right? Which in, in modern medicine, we still have kind of like that idea that every that the genesis of every disease has to be biological right? like the biological etiology of diseases and that also includes mental diseases because psychiatry is supposed to be a branch of biological medicine right so any sort of uh, emotional suffering or psychological suffering will be somehow still uh, rooted in some sort of biological reality there may be correlates yeah but not necessarily uh, a causation well yeah i mean that you know what you're describing is 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 um very similar, or at least I guess like a development of all of these ideas that have become very pr prominent, at least nowadays in the philosophy of mind, right? Like the embodied cognition and so on and so forth. And, you know, even further than that, in, from, from the, from Latin American epistemologies, what is called the epistemologies of the South, right? Which is kind of like this, not competing with alternative or different epistemologies that emerge from the global South, particularly from Latin America. There is, um, even better, you know, like more extended developments about what embodied cognition is. That it's not just that our mind is interdependent and uh, inter constituting itself through relationships and fully embodied, but also that it is rooted in the land that we inhabit, right? That is that, that our mind extends outwards from our individuality and into the environment that nourishes us. And this is something that, for example, in the Amazonian ontologies is implicit, right? Like the the, the way that people interact with their environment uh, takes into account that there isn't really a discontinuity between individuals and environment and the features of the environment and that the mind really encompasses all of those features. So it's a really, really interesting contrast from the compartmentalization and hyper individualization and kind of like more and more and more and more specialization into tiny parts of the brain to lucky things versus kind of like this contrast where well yeah i mean it's important to find the correlates but also there's kind of like all this whole other world of relationships that um are primary in many ways yeah i think there's uh something you said at the beginning that was like really important is like we all have metaphysical assumptions and a lot of these assumptions are culturally driven. Yeah. So um, the, there's a philosopher, Bernardo Castro, and, you know, he talks about a lot about kind of breaking down materialism, like this belief that everything that consciousness arises just from from matter and that everything just arises from physical interactions. And, and like a lot of that's like the dominant worldview that people hold. Uh, you know, even if we think we don't hold that view, like I, I've explored this in myself and there's still like threads, there's threads of materialistic thinking. Um, so a lot of like transforming mental health is like, what is your, what, how do you understand the mind? What is the mind? Because if you think the mind is just a bunch of neurons in the brain and that's all it is, then of course you have this very different understanding of reality and your self identity. And Perhaps, I mean, this is what happened to me, at least, and, and maybe the same happened to you is with using psychedelics. There was a complete like, you know, there was a basically from thinking I was an atheist, right, thinking I was a full blown atheist materialist to use psychedelics and like, whoa, like all of that getting blown apart. Like, I don't know what reality is like. I, I thought that this is just I'm in this body and I'm this body and everything's arising from inside. But now. I'm not sure. And it, it seems like it's way more mysterious and way more uh, profound and, and expansive. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, they, I, I very much share that trajectory. I don't know you, where you've landed in the end, but you know, I can tell you for myself, I did go through a similar kind of like um, atheist, punk, um, you know, a materialist, uh, towards kind of like having my mind blown. And then 
going into this hyper spiritual phase and so on and so forth. I mean, it's kind of like been a journey. And I think right, like right now in a place where where I feel the most comfortable, which, you know, in my perspective right now is the only sensible or logical place to land after all these explorations, which is just kind of like, you know, a sort of agnosticism where I remain open to possibilities, but not necessarily subscribing to any one particular worldview. And I think, you know, this is important for me because a big part of my work has also been kind of exploring the darker side of psychedelics or what happens when um, psychedelics are, whether maliciously or non-intentionally, responsible to some extent for people buying into belief systems that aren't necessarily good for them nor for society, which is something that tends to happen quite a bit a lot. I mean... I think the last few years we have seen also kind of like the pendulum swing out to the other side where other people, um, you know, in the psychedelic community or spiritual communities have gravitated towards ideologies that weren't necessarily what you would expect from people that are trying to find enlightenment or to be better people or better social subjects. Um, so, you know, I think like a, a big part of the work for people in these communities is also kind of like trying to find those frameworks where people can remain skeptical and critical and develop a lot of really strong critical thinking faculties to be able to contemplate all of the things that are opened up in these states um, without necessarily allowing that to also radicalize us in a different direction. Yeah, like it's the one thing that I see a lot, for example, with plant medicine people. Right? Like people go and drink ayahuasca many times and then they start buying into kind of like this new agey animistic worldview that is presented to them through the uh, centers that they attend or through the facilitators that serve the medicine. And then there's oftentimes also sort of like unspiritual belief systems attached to that worldview. And once you buy into one, then everything else kind of like just comes rolling in and you know, and then people just end up with these really weird mixtures of commercialized animism and caricature-like ontologies, and then also some sort of like really weird proto-antisemitic conspiracy theories. And it's just, you know, like this is something that um, is very important just to keep track of. So we're, you know, particularly people that are offering or working with psychedelics that we're offering frameworks of interpretation and meaning making that don't necessarily are steering people towards uh something else yeah but we're just like really offering kind of like a more neutral way um of precisely that like having our own reckoning with our own ideologies and seeing what our own belief systems are like and then having that capacity to be critical and skeptical about the things that we think yeah i think this is um one of the reasons that I really wanted to connect with you and, and speak about, and I, like, I ran across your site called Healing from Healing. Right. I think a lot of what you're speaking about is is embedded in this in this project that you're doing, and um, I've had you know a similar kind of. I think I had a similar experience uh, with psychedelics, and I think you know it kind of blow. The, the thing with psychedelics, it really expands your mind. It blows everything open, and now it's like everything is a possibility. And it makes you very susceptible for picking things up, and I think this is the good thing about it, but it is also the potentially dangerous thing about it is that in these environments, when you're using these things, it's very easy for beliefs to get planted into your mind. It's very easy for other people's views to kind of sneak their way into your mind. Yeah. And um, and and that's what happens. A lot of times people use, you know, use these plants and they and these medicines and in various environments and then they just pick up what's around. And it's it's a very critic like it's a very sensitive time for your mind. It's a very sensitive time for uh, your meaning making system. Yes. Um, and yeah, it's 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 like I see the same thing. I think I've seen the same patterns and the same kind of similar pathologies and like, um, you know, it's interesting because a lot of what you said, it was like, you know, seeing that the dominant worldview is like this very um, left brain kind of driven, like we're going to achieve things, we're going to try to control nature, everything's hyper individualistic. And like you're speaking out against that. And that's I think a lot of people come to that realization through their psychedelic experiences. And then it's like, well, let's throw the intellect out. Let's throw the critical thinking out. Let's throw skepticism out. Let's throw science out. Let's throw all that away. Yeah. That's the evil. That's the evil white man. That's the evil. You know what I'm saying? The, the colonialism and all of that. And it's like, 
then you're coming and you're saying, no, 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 hold on. <laughs> we like we need to see that there's pathologies here, but we also need to integrate that and put these yeah. worlds together somehow. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I do feel that many times people do throw the baby with the bathwater, you know, in uh, kind of like rejecting all the, and, you know, this goes for everything. The religions we grow up with, spiritual systems we grow up with, the scientific model as a whole. I mean, the amount of people that I met in the rainforest that, you know, are disdainful of book learning, for example, like, oh, no, that's just intellectual learning that serves nothing unless you're experientially learning. That's kind of a very widespread belief amongst like plant medicine, spiritual people, right? Like, oh, like the only kind of learning is what you, what spirit puts you through. Like there's nothing you can learn in books, so on and so forth. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, again, like I think this is obviously the key to many things when it comes to integration is also like being able to integrate epistemologies and ontologies and ways of looking at the world and you know let's say like the best that each system has to offer and the good things that every um yeah and yeah the good things that different people come with i don't think there's one particular way of looking at the world that is better than others i think they all depend exactly on the environments that we grow up in obviously like a person that grows in the rainforest all of their lives you know from from age zero uh and they have a very different capacity for perception i mean this goes really back to the basic building blocks of cognition right like the perception of things changes this is something that we've demonstrated uh time and time again in western psychology when it comes to understanding perception right like the environments that we are uh, exposed to in our early years determine determine in many ways the kind of shapes that we perceive, the kind of sounds that we're able to hear, the kind of interactions between objects that come to mind, right? Like there's kind of this classic uh, contrast amongst like, oh, like, well, Western people are always going to pick out individuals from a picture where there's Oriental people are always going to focus on the context, right? Like the background, like they, they're more likely to perceive kind of like right brain ideas of the whole versus left brain individual components of the picture. So, you know, I think these differences in perception and then in cognition create different worldviews. Obviously, they create different ontologies. They create different ways of understanding, interacting, meaning making, and sense making the environment that we're part of. Um, so again, like people, you know, people like me, or people like you, or like Western people that grew up for 35, 40 years in Western or Westernized countries, they go to the rainforest and they drink ayahuasca. And then they hear from their facilitators or they hear from the owners of the retreat center or sometimes kind of like half fast translations of whatever the actual indigenous healers are saying. And they're like, oh, of course, you know, like I'm not depressed. I have a spirit attached in my mind. I have a blood sucking entity that is draining me from my energy because this is a worldview of the rainforest. And Mother Ayahuasca told me that, you know, and the person, instead of having kind of like this the weight of a psychiatric diagnosis that needs to be medicated goes back home and now has the weight of like a blood sucking entity that is draining their life force. And I mean, what is better really, you know, like what kind of, what kind of story would you likely, would you like to carry better? I mean, okay, this is kind of like an exaggeration. Yeah. But these are things that happen. I mean, I've seen that happen. So this is kind of like one example that I oftentimes give, like, right? Like when we, when we're trying to change a story based on a cultural or ontological building block, it's important also that we're not installing another one that makes even less sense to that person. Um, I mean, what are you going to do? Yeah, are we going to go to, where, where are you going to go in New York or in Los Angeles or in London now that you believe that what you have is that you have a blood sucking entity draining your life force? I mean, the, the psychiatrist is not going to help you. <laughs> it's going to make things worse. <laughs> like, so, I mean, this is, these are complicated things when it comes to, when it comes really to like the ideologies that prime these kinds of interpretations in things. Um, but on the other hand, right, like there's a lot of value in getting like a good, solid, let's say neutral overview of what is an Amazonian ontology, for example. How do people in the rainforest actually experience their relationality, the way of getting sick or being ill or healing, you know, what it means really to, to grow up experiencing the world in an animistic manner where the world is not a collection of objects to be exploited for human gain, but a community of subjects with which you interact horizontally 
the importance of reciprocity and mutual responsibility towards everything that is sentient. And, you know, sentience in the rainforest includes everything. There's people, there's birds, there's trees, there's plants, there's rocks, rivers, like everything is an equal or everything is an equal. Um, so, you know, when people grow up with that kind of story, right? Like, well, everything in my environment is my equal. I'm not superior to anything. The birds and the jaguars and the rocks and the rivers, they're all people. They're, you know, there's human people and there's also non-human people, but we all share the same basic building blocks of what it means to be human. Sentience, intelligence, agency, intentionality, the capacity to feel and hold grudges and get mad and feel sad and feel joyful. Um, you know, that primes people to interact with their environment in a very different way, in a much more fearful and respectful way that gives them already a good head start in let's say trying to or you know managing harmoniously and balanced ways their interactions with their environment whereas if you grow up in a culture that is based on consumerism and exploitation of resources uh indiscriminately and where you know the ideology is that the wealthier richer the more that you hoard resources from others the more respect that you get and the more that people look i mean this is the kind of idea for example in amazon societies would be looked down as pathology right you were and this is a good example you were in the in the beginning you were asking me about like what cultural psychiatry is or what medical anthropology is. this is one insight for example that i have when I was in the rainforest, I was very interested in what was people's idea of madness. Like in the West, we have a very particular idea of what it means to be mad. I said, oh, that, that person is crazy. Uh, and what we mean actually is like that person's uh, experience doesn't match what I think should, his experience should be or the collective experience should be. That person is crazy because there's a split. And that's literally the definition of schizophrenia. Right? There's a split between that person's internal experience and the external reality in which that person's life unfolds, or at the very least, what society has deemed that external reality is consensually. Um, so, you know, schizophrenia, madness, that, that person is crazy. We oftentimes refer to um, a difference or a split, an abnormal internal experience in relation to the external circumstances. But in the Amazon, when I asked that question, the answers were very different because they were never really about a person, uh, a person's particular experience. They were always about social things. For example, they would say, well, for me, a crazy person is a crazy that has too much yuca, which is this white tuber root. That is kind of one of the staple foods in the, in the a person that has too much yuca and eating too much carbs. Yeah. <laughs> but you you know, like, like he has too much of it. He harvested too much of it and he's not sharing it with his community. He's instead of that, just hoarding it and letting it rot or not fermenting it and making you know, a manioc beer or a person, you know, a person that has too much of something, seeing that his friends and his community members are starving or hungry. And instead of sharing, uh, it's just hoarding. Like that, that idea of hoarding unnecessary, like unnecessarily hoarding resources when other people are needing them, that is the archetypal perception of what it means to be crazy in that kind of society, which tells you a lot, right? It tells you a lot because that's exactly the archetype of success that we idealize in the West in many ways. So, oh, this has, has three, three yachts and four houses. It doesn't use any of them, but it just has them. Right? Like it doesn't make sense. Like why would you have too much of something that you're not using while other people are hungry, right? So this is, this is in many ways kind of like how the ideology that underlies the society or the world of the very immediate experience of what it means to be alive in that moment in time, right? The, the immediacy of the suffering, I guess, without the detachment of all the mediated symbols that we have in the West uh, creates a very different definition or a very different perception of abnormality, right? Like what it means to be outside of the paradigm of sanity within that particular context. Um, I don't know how we got into that particular part, but I think that's kind of just going to segue into something we were talking about before. Yeah, I, I trust the flow of the conversation, but I, yeah. think, I think what you're sharing right now is fascinating is this, this worldview of, uh, the having too much of something becomes a problem and that you know that's kind of like an, what an addiction is it's like you need more and more and it's the sense of greed and it's interesting how you can go to the amazonian rain rainforest and go to this very uh traditional culture this this uh indigenous culture and gain these insights where it's not like 
you're going to bring them back and going to try to make this a rainforest and switch modern society to be how it was there. But no, let's take this insight and see how we can integrate it into our modern society and actually see that, oh, this whole having to save a lot and having to have a lot in the bank and have all these reserves, a lot of that is based on fear and like this excess obsession with security, right? And also kind of separation from the world, not trusting that there's abundance in the world, not trusting that we can get more that I have to get what I can get and I need to hoard it so I can protect myself because I'm somehow separate from everybody else. And yeah. the world is not going to hold me. The earth is not going to hold me and not going to provide me resources later. So I got to get as much as I can now. This is exactly, I think, that one of the key aspects of all of this. Yeah, like Because you say in the West, we have kind of like this need to hoard resources or to have like large bank accounts because there's a looming fear. Right, like we're in constant fear. We're not have a ha we're not gonna have enough. There's nobody to take care of us, particularly in North America nowadays. Like even if you get sick and if you don't have money, they're just left to die, <laughs> right? Um, and this is this is not a man. I mean, it is a manufactured fear in many ways because manufactured through the way that the society uh, is unfolding. But it's a real fear. I mean, you know, like people really have that anxiety, which is real. I mean, it, the kind of society where you really. You know, the erosion of our social connectedness, the atomization of people into individuals, the complete breakdown of community ties. I mean, there, there still are some co community ties within certain particular pockets of society. You know, communities that are very tightly knit tend to be very religious or very ethnocentric or very exclusivist or very elitist, elitistic and so on and so forth. But, you know, within the wide society, like there is an increasing sense of, um, like a radical independence, right? This is actually one of the founding ideas within kind of like Western neoliberal society, like radical independence and self-reliance, kind of like the burning man ethos, right? Like you have to be 100% independent, self-reliant. You always have to make sure that you can provide for yourself and so on and so forth. Um, the opposite, well, not the opposite, but let's say in like more traditional societies, that idea is ridiculous, right? Like there's, 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 it's, it's, it counters, it counters uh, human nature, it counters human evolution, right? Like people understand very deeply the truth of interdependence, that nobody is radically independent. I mean, nowadays it's, it's, it's almost absurd when people in North America talk about like being like radically independent. I mean, radically independent of what? But like people don't know how to grow a lettuce. You know, radically independent nowadays means that you're making enough money doing some third order symbolic work that you can go to a supermarket that you expect to always be fully stocked when you have no idea what the supply chain, how the supply chain even works to get that lettuce from the other side of the world into a supermarket in California. But like this radical independence has become uh, a caricature because most people, we don't know how to be like minimally <laughs> independent. I mean, you throw somebody outside of the confines of consumerist society where we can't actually get shit on the supermarket, where we can't get gas at the gas station, where we can't get Wi-Fi at coffee shops. And we don't know how to do anything, absolutely nothing. Like people are completely helpless. Like this idea of independence is such a charade of consumerist culture. Um, but you know, when, when you actually go and spend time with people in rainforests or mountains and so on and so forth, like you understand what actually independence means, which is not necessarily like that kind of consumerist pipe dream of radical independence in a financial way, but actually there's like that truth of interdependence where there's small groups, there are communities where people know, right? Like, well, you know what, if you don't have food to eat this week, it's okay. You're not going to starve. You're not going to end up in the street because there's other people in your community that will help you through the hard time. And then, right, implicitly, even though it isn't like a written contract, but implicitly, it's like, well, you know, they also know that whenever they are going through a hard patch because their harvest wasn't as good or their cow died or something happened, then they can rely on their neighbors as well for sustenance and push them through that you know rough patch so there's there's a much deeper sense of interdependence it's like well i don't have to be radically independent i don't know i don't have to grow all this shit for myself i don't have to hoard all this shit for myself i don't have to like ruin the whole environment uh you know just to make sure that i have enough wood to last me through 20 winters i mean that's ridiculous i know that it's okay if i don't do that 
because my neighbor is going to help me. And if not, then the council is going to make sure that I don't freeze to death. And if not, then you know, there's kind of like that more, much more socialized, interdependent understanding of what thriving means. So not only survival, but thriving, right? The thriving requires kind of like that foundational reciprocity amongst people. Um, otherwise, I mean, this is you know, just a very big difference in the way the societies are structured, but one that has allowed people in South America, for example, Andean people and lowland people to, you know, not only survive, but thrive throughout many, many centuries, just having that interdependent out outlook and that um, reciprocity as a primary moral imperative. Yeah, I think what you're speaking about, too, it relates to a lot of what Charles Eisenstein speaks about. And, um, you, you know, it, it, this idea of uh, fuck you money, like people want fuck you money. And the whole idea of that is that I have all this money. I don't need you. I can pay for anything. I, I can just hire whoever. And it, it seems like a really good idea. Right. It's on, on if you don't really think about it, it seems like, oh, it's great. I don't need I don't need to depend on anybody. But then it kind of alienates people that potentially do make this kind of money and they're living in a fortress and now they're like i don't need to have relationships with anybody i don't know who grows my food it doesn't matter like i just call you know whole foods and they somebody drops it off i'm completely removed from everybody and i i there's an illusion right there's an illusion that i'm radically independent and that i don't need anybody but actually i'm relying on people growing my food i'm relying on somebody cleaning my house i'm relying on somebody building my house like i don't know how to do i can't do all, all of these things like no one human can do all of these things and they were actually very dependent on other people but there's this illusion of certainty and control that i'm controlling everything and that i don't need anybody else and and i yeah. think that's what you're kind of saying that's what you're pointing to that there's this we're embedded in this kind of understanding of what we need. This is what success looks like. This is what we need to achieve. And the the bigger our fortress gets and the more removed we get from who we actually are on a deeper level. Yeah. And, you know, like as, as we approach more and more, I guess, um, the limits of collapse, these things, I think, you know, they, they might get more real for a lot of people. I mean, that, there's, there's now kind of like all this, drive of um you know silicon people to build the fortresses of doomsday apocalypse retreats and so on and so forth right like the idea like oh well i have all these resources so i'm gonna make sure that i can weather through you know the bad weather of collapse because i can hoard canned food and i can pay a private army of security people but is it this you know this is kind of like the extreme or you know the billionaires that want to escape earth and colonize mars um and start kind of like a new society but, you know, again, like these, these are all uh, illusions. These are exactly illusions. I mean, you know, like, okay, you're going to hire a, a private army to guard you off from the hungry hordes after collapse. But, you know, how, how is that going to work after the fictions of, you know, after the fictions that gave you that power start collapsing, where your paper money is not worth anything anymore, where the status that Western capitalistic society conveyed in you as a is worth nothing because now we're in a completely different phase of human reorganization. I mean, what army is going to guard you from what? I mean, people are going to turn on you on the first moment they can get a sandwich in their hands, right? So this kind of like all of these illusions where people think uh, what independence can be based on a very narrow definition of hoarding resources or having enough power or money to be able to command some sort of authority that is very likely to evaporate in one second once those structures or those fictions, those storytelling fictions that we're telling ourselves about our communities and our societies start collapsing in the face of like actual real environmental emergencies. Yeah, um, I feel like this this thread we can follow really far because there's so much to it. I, I am curious, though, um, to talk about kind of the integration work you do. Yeah. Um, you know, so let's say that I've just finished, you know, a psych a ayahuasca ceremony or whatever, and I'm coming to you with I've had this insane experience that I've never had before that doesn't, you know, map to anything else that I've done before. Like, this is my first time using a psychedelic. What does the process look like? How do you guide somebody where? You know, how do you guide this person to integrate this experience that it could be the most potential in their life or most beneficial and avoid some of the potential pathologies that could linger in? 
Yeah, well, I mean, you know, based on my experience uh, for, for many years being in these kinds of environments, I come to the realization that the first most important thing is similar to what uh, medical doctors have as the first thing, right? Like, first, do no harm. Um, and I think that should be the precept for everybody that is doing this work, because what I've seen more often than not is that people do tend to make a lot of harm precisely by planting the seeds of bad ideas or different ideologies or certain belief systems that relate to like, oh, now you've seen the light and this is the explanation that we're giving you for how things work in this new reality that you're now encountered. And, you know, I guess this is the story of the world, really, right? Like the person has like a mystical experience or a non-ordinary state. And then somebody comes and say, oh, now you've seen that. Now I can tell you why that happened or how it works or who are these entities in the fifth dimension that are giving you this message because you have this thing to do for our community. And then you're in a sect. And then before you know it, you're trapped in this fucked up reality that you never even have an idea. I mean, again, this is an exaggeration, but happens quite often, or even in more subtle ways, right? Like people do get trapped into these realms of uh, ideology and metaphysical beliefs because they had an experience and then somebody who was not very careful tried to give them some answers. It made sense, whatever. There was social pressure. It doesn't really matter. So first, do no harm. The first thing, the first thing that we do is we listen. Like, hey, like, what's your experience like? And we just listen and listen and people tell us what they see. And there's no need and try to explain what that was. It's just a need to, like, really listen and be curious. Well, what, 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 what was that like for you? What is your interpretation of it? How do you accommodate that experience within your existing worldviews? So, and not in those words. Yeah, you try to kind of like first <laughs> kind of like draw out maybe for that person to articulate what is their worldview first and foremost. These are things that many people haven't really thought about. What, what, what do you mean? What is my worldview? Right? Like, well, you know, what exists? What is you know? Like each person, I guess, has kind of like a naive ontology. Or, you know, more importantly, a naive epistemology, a way, epistemology in the sense of like a way that we make sense of information and we weave narratives and we create stories and we sense make the things that happen. Uh, most people have not really given this much thought, to be honest. Yeah, like this is not something that we learn in a very systematic way. So, you know, I think like for me, it always starts first and foremost, maybe with having, giving people a few tools uh, or a few pointers of how to start understanding what their sense making process is like, uh, what their worldview is like, and then how that experience can fit or cannot fit within those already existing structures. And then you can start scaffolding, right? Like the, I mean, the way that I call it is like scaffolding those worldviews to be able to accommodate those experiences in a way that don't create harm. This is, I guess there's two main, the way that I see it, I guess there's two main potentially dangerous uh, situations in this first or in these early stages of sense making these experiences. The first one has to do with the person that is helping or facilitating, which is like really our carelessness in indoctrinating or um, planting seeds into another person in a very suggestible state, like you said before. And the second one is when a person has a very rigid worldview or a very rigid sense-making process and the experiences that they experience don't really fit that model and then something breaks. Yeah, those are the two situations in my view where um, we can have negative outcomes uh, in the short term or the long term if we are not able to fix that um, on the on the go. So, yeah, so, you know, like the first thing would be to try and understand very, very deeply what that experience was like for the person, then try to understand very, very deeply what are the existing structures uh, for that person to understand the world that they live in and their sense making mechanisms and their personal epistemology on how to process information and create new stories and narratives and identify belief systems. And then uh, again, like maybe scaffolding their worldview so they can expand and have different perspectives of being very careful not to actually indoctrinate. And there's ways to do that, right? Like, for example, it's just a lot of that is language, right? Like, for example, hey, like, uh, instead of saying like, Oh, you know why that is? Because A, B, C, D, D, and there's these entities and like the, the ultimate, like this thing that like new agey conspiratorial people love to say, right? Oh, like the ultimate, the ultimate nature of reality is that so and so and so and so, or the foundational dynamics of reality or the fifth dimension. Or, I mean, 
that kind of language is absurd, right? Like if somebody, if anybody pretends to know what they're talking about when it comes to the mysteries of life, the best thing you can do is turn around and run away. But there's other ways in which you can offer like ideas, right? Like, well, you know, let me tell you a little bit more about uh, how the Shipibo people in the Amazon understand and perceive their worldview, right? Like maybe that can give you a few ideas on how to interpret your experiences. Or let me tell you more about what that particular thing can mean, right? According to this particular structure or belief systems. Or, you know, have you ever have you have you ever been exposed to uh Dzogchen tradition? Or have you ever heard about this concept that comes from this particular lineage? You know, like like trying to maybe enrich the person's experience in the same way that you would through kind of like an educational approach of suggestions for new things to discover and explore and new ideas to perhaps look into as opposed to oh well this is how she is and if you don't know it it's because you don't get it yet right like this is the kind of absurd situations that i had to witness time and time again right like people just telling other people like oh well if you don't see this yet because it's, you don't get it yet you haven't drunk enough ayahuasca you haven't dieted enough you haven't done things right because you just don't get it yet like okay well how fucked up that is like, right? like trying to indoctrinate somebody into a very particular narrow way of understanding phenomena according to that one particular reality tunnel so right reality tunnel is a good concept in this case right like we want to we want to expand a person's reality tunnel but we don't want to exchange the reality tunnel for a different reality tunnel we just want to expand it to allow it to kind of encompass more phenomena and perhaps more experiences to you know uh perhaps expand the sense of what's possible and what can be real without necessarily saying like oh like this is real you know like oh you know maybe this can be something that i haven't thought about that is part of the world that exists within this reality that is part of the code of this particular program without saying like, oh no that's that's definitely what the code is like right so it's, it's kind of like a subtle difference but one that makes all the difference eventually uh, when trying to help somebody during this kind of early stages of sense making. Yeah, I, I like what you're saying. What what I'm hearing is that in, instead of you know somebody having one lens, and then you and then them having this experience, and you're like, hey, this is a better lens. Take this lens. Now it's like, no, no, no. These are all lenses. There's a bunch of them. We don't even know. There's an infinite amount of these lenses, and they all can affect your life in a different way. And like, try on this lens. Try on this lens. And it's also like a like a magne uh, metacognitive approach of like thinking about your thinking, thinking about your worldview and like seeing things in a more exp expansive light. Like that's what I'm hearing you say. Um, and, yeah. And, and I definitely, I think I've also experienced this of, you know, somebody's, you know, and there's more and more people every day serving medicine, uh, you know, and, and having, you know, doing these ceremonies. And then once they start doing them, they kind of, inadvertently pick up like the guru hat and it's like i'm the guru i've done this so many times i've done ayahuasca so many times or i've done five meo so many times and it's like i now i know things that you don't and you need to do yeah. it more and then and like now i've you know i've tried traversed all these dimensions and then it's it, it's this very subtle thing that i think people don't see so like i'm curious how you know because we have so many people administrating it, and it's it's not regulated, you know, because for the most part, psychedelics are s still illegal in, in a lot of part in a lot of the world. So people just do it anywhere. How do we what what is going forward? How do we do we regulate it? How do we train people? Um, you know, like you've had a lot of training in, in psychology and psychiatry and, and you have a background in this. So you kind of know somebody's potential pitfalls. But a lot of people just you know, they use ayahuasca or they use some of these medicines and they're like, oh, I, I'm called to serve medicine and they go do it. And then they don't necessarily have all these tools to to not do harm, right? It's the, the first thing, to not do harm. And they not only don't help somebody, they potentially make things worse. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think I have like a very enlightening or useful answers about regulation and these things. I think we're we're in a learning curve Unfortunately, there's gonna, you know, there's gonna be casualties as with anything else that we're only figuring out. And you know, one of the nowadays, I guess the majority, or at least not, if not the majority, at least a big percentage of the people that reach out to me that I work with, they reach out to me because of my platform, 
you know, like through Healing from Healing, a lot of people in the last year or so have sent me messages, inquired about what kind of help I could offer. And it often, it almost always comes down to people that have been harmed because of bad facilitation. People that did psychedelics, they oftentimes went to an ayahuasca retreat or they went to a 5-MEO DNT ceremony with somebody who wasn't experienced or uh, skilled enough to help them navigate that in a skillful way. And then they came up more confused than they were before and with less clarity and with all sorts of weird fucked up ideas installed in their operating systems. Some of them uh, are people that are, you know, uh, recovering from actual malicious abuse. You know, like some of the people that I've been working with in the last year are people that whether it's through psychedelics or other spiritual environments, they found themselves they found themselves in really toxic environments, what some people would call sects or cults or just like extremely toxic power dynamics amongst you know particular communities, and they're looking for ways to heal from it. So I have uh, gained a lot of experience and a lot of insights about all the well, not all of them, but many of the different potential things that can go wrong in these situations and trying to figure out on the go how to best help people. Um, first and foremost, I guess, reframe things. So the will revert the damage, saying so one way to revert the damage that has been done. And then not only that, but being able to reframe things to actually get the benefit that they were seeking in the first place uh, before somebody um, ended up creating more confusion for them. So I think, you know, this is going to be part of the process. It's going to be that, uh, unfortunately, until we find a good status quo in terms of balance and harmony, in terms of who are the people that are sanctioned to be able to do this kind of work, um, yeah, we're going to have casualties. We're going to have people, you know, ending up worse off than they were. And then there's going to be other people like me or other people that I know like, well, let's try and correct that. And then, you know, like things build up over time and information will uh, start kind of like percolating to the surface and we're going to come up with protocols and different things. I think regulation is a very, very tricky thing to do, particularly when it comes to psychedelics. There's a lot of gate gatekeeping that's already happening that I think is very harmful on one hand, but at the same time, you do want people to have the right training even though not necessarily the right credentials, because credentialing, particularly in North America, is a pretty fucked up gatekeeping process um, that is also rooted in very complex, harmful social dynamics. But definitely you want people that are trained, people that are accountable for the work that they do, people that are regulated to some extent by, I don't know, regulating agencies. It looks very really authoritarian to me, but... You know, I think ideally, ideally, there, I, I, you know, I mean, I'm an, I'm an anarchist at heart, like at least in my, in my way of understanding what social organization can be and like resource management can be. I think that anarchism, in a, you know, social anarchism or anarcho syndicalism or some sort of kind of like small scale approach, obviously, that is not necessarily scalable or extrapolable to the kind of uh, nation state that we have today, but that's a whole other conversation. But I think like, People left their own devices in small, tightly knit communities that interact with other tightly small knit communities uh, are best suited to be able to do these things because they can self-regulate and people are accountable and people can, I mean, this is how it works, for example, in rainforest, right? This is kind of my example. Um, you want to find uh, a person amongst, you know, I don't know, you go to a Shipibo town or a, a Shaninka town or even a Mestizo community in the rainforest in Peru. And you say you're another Mestizo and you want to, you know, I have this thing going on and I want to find somebody that can help me with the thing. And people are going to tell you, right? people are going to tell you, well, you know, that person over there in that hut. He works with the plants, but also he is known to be a womanizer and is known to steal. And, you know, like maybe he's good at this thing, but not great at this thing. And then that other person over there, uh, he's not as skilled, but he's honest. Right? Like people like, you know, the way that gossip works in small communities is kind of like a way to self-regulate kind of like the social dynamics and provide information for people. But by the end of the day, you know, the point is that the best... Um, 
the best compass or the best measure that people will have for who to work with is um you know based on community relationships but like ask like this is kind of like one of the basic things that i tell people when they're trying to figure out like oh like who should i go and drink with who should i go and work with like who what circle what kind of circle should i go and have my psychedelic awakening with and like well where do you live right like where, what is your local environment like uh are you connected to people with the same interests are you regularly attending events that cater to that particular thing and you ask around people like hey like i have this like this is like one of the one of the worst things i guess about the increasing atomization and the erosion of our social bonds and the loneliness and alienation of modernity that you know like the majority of people don't really have answers for these questions because people don't have that kind of relationship with people anymore like we don't have neighbor like you know in in north america i think it's most prevalent but people don't know their neighbors you get into the elevator and you look down on the floor you're hoping that people don't talk to you uh if somebody comes and knocks on your door asking for something like the weirdest thing in the world like why is my neighbor bothering me for a glass of you know like things that are so normal and so day-to-day things in many parts of the world that are still you know like it, it would be unthinkable for people living in a village in peru or even in a street in southern spain for example right or a town in mexico that you don't know the names uh of the people that live in your same radios or the people in your environment your building or that you go into the elevator and you say you know good morning barely but you don't never really know anything about the people that you're cohabiting and coexisting with right so let's say uh like that that would be like the first thing that we need to address before we even go into those things is like like really fixing the immediacy of how our lives unfold within those little communities because if we really want to work with somebody that we know is going to be accountable that we know is going to be responsible that we know is going to help us in a good way then we also need to have a way of knowing that other people feel that same way too that there's a sort of like barometer for the kind of work people do that is beyond the self-serving marketing that we see every day right like you go into instagram you go into tiktok you go into thing and it's like oh like i'm a self-appointed integrator in structure and a medicine provider and like these are the testimonials of people that i work with who the fuck knows who wrote those testimonials first and foremost but it doesn't really matter right like it's all marketing it's all like pick me pick me pick me Pick me amongst this sea of offers of like people that are some of them maybe more skilled than others, some of them maybe more honest than others, some of them more be. But it's very difficult to because you know when people are picking somebody out of like Instagram profiles, right? Like you know, there's 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 it's it's all marketing. Oh, I like that person's aesthetics better than I like that person's aesthetics, or I like the the way that that person wrote that post better than what that person wrote the post. But that doesn't really give you any sort of information about anything that is relevant to the kind of thing that you're going to do. You need to ask people. You need to know, right? Well, well, how, how, what, what, what is the actual community that that person is part of? Will tell me if I ask them about what kind of work that person does, right? Like people that already work with that people. If I went to talk with them and say, like, well, how, how did that person hold space when you were sense making your experience, right? But we don't have really access to those things for the most part, and that is the kind of thing that is very difficult to to gauge in our societies. You know, we can't we can't go on the village and just knock on people's doors and like, hey, like I want to go to that shaman across the street. Like, what do you think about him, right? Like, or hey, like if you were sick, who you go who you go to? Who would you who would you who would you allow you you know to treat your child? It's very important that we kind of get that dimension of um, you know mutually responsible, tightly knit uh, community. And you know, people are fa- people are trying to recreate that. It's kind of like whole other conversation. <laughs> Maybe we don't want to go into it, but you know, all the mimetic tribes and the online tribalism and like the chronically online crowd, right? Of like trying to find that sense of belonging, that sense of tribalism, that sense of like, you know, amongst kind of like this very dysfunctional and very toxic virtual environments, right? But you know, if we translated that back into real life, that would be the answer to many of the things that we're suffering from. Yeah, that that's what was coming up for me, actually, also, is just the idea of how you have, you know, the big social platforms, Facebook, Instagram, whatever. And then you have now, this is what I've been doing is finding these kind of niche communities where people are have 
common interests and and some expertise and more knowledge in specific fields and and building relationships there because you know, like just on on Facebook when I'm you know I have my feed and I have all these people I know and they're just from different walks of life and we're not even really connected like we we don't have any real relationship and we're not bonding over things that uh, mutual mutual resonance is like it, it's just very random so there is like you know in a big city you have the big city like i'm from new york and if somebody here like says hi to you it, it, you think the person's insane like I, i've I've seen i've seen somebody like literally like oh this somebody said hi to a, a person i was with and they were like oh this guy is crazy and i'm like why like why because he said hi because we're so not used to it in New York, in other states, it's it's more common. Um, but this is how the city is. Like this is how we kind of cope because we're in a city and we're around so many people. Yeah. And it's almost it's almost like draining to uh, actually care how to ask somebody how are you and to actually listen to every single person. So we just say how are you as a hi and we keep keep moving along. Yeah. Nobody has time for that. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody's just running around. Um, but but it it does seem like there is this need for. Uh, these deeply embedded uh, niche communities yeah. uh, within a big city, right? You have this yeah. big city, but you have smaller communities and it, it subgroups where we go. And it's like, this is, you know, this is my community where people know about psychedelics and I can trust them and I can ask them. And this is my community where I go and I ask people about like uh, business or marketing or whatever else, in different communities and, and having ties with them. Yeah, exactly. So um, I'm, also, I guess this is kind of the insight that I'm been sitting with, and, and maybe you have a similar one. But do you think that the healing process of psychedelics can be improved by integrating ancient wisdom with modern day therapeutic modalities? And I'm asking this because, you know, I've had experiences just doing like ayahuasca and it's very uh, shamanic kind of setting. And, and a lot of the the training comes from the jungle from the amazonians from the dietas and it's been profound it's been very healing for me and i know a lot of people that had, had similar you know experiences but then you also i hear a lot of people having um experiences where they're very confusing or they're very like oh i drank ayahuasca and nothing happened like i did it like three four times and it didn't hit me um and then you know, now it's you have um, I had a, this guy, Saj Razvi, on my show. He's a trauma therapist and he does psychedelic psychotherapy and he's incorporating a lot of somatic kind of therapies and modalities. And he works with also with cannabis and ketamine. And his approach is very fine tuned and it's very like being there with the person, ho almost like holding the person's hand and guiding them through. You know, he, he works with a lot of trauma, so guiding them through the trauma process. So yeah. on one hand, you have this kind of very like one-on-one, um, -on -one, like very just feeling into the person's body and like guiding them through their experience. Whereas a lot of times, at least in my experience, when you have ayahuasca ceremony, it's a lot more you're you're there together, but you're not necessarily being like your hand is not being held and you're not being guided very gently through uh, through every feeling and every thought and everything that's happening. So I'm wondering if there's a way to integrate both of these approaches, kind of the modern therapeutic approaches and then the ancient wisdom that we have from indigenous cultures and to potentially get more potential from uh, these these experiences. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I think it is very important. This is, you know, exactly by what I was saying before, I think, you know, for a, for a person that is holding space or providing <laughs> kind of services, integration or whatever we want to call it, it is very important to first be, you know, as widely educated as we can, not only in terms of like a particular set of skills, a particular thing, but, you know, in a broad sense, kind of like a classical education when it comes to philosophy, when it comes to ontology, when it comes to anthropology, when it comes to, again, like being able to understand and transmit certain concepts or aspects of what it means to be human in a very simple level, right? In terms of like different ways of understanding what human suffering is, different ways of understanding what ontology uh, is. So being, to, being able to explain different ways of sense-making information in terms of, you know, simple things. I think like, you know, again, a classical education, being able to draw references from art, 
and you know like being able to bring metaphors from literary works or from movies i mean i think all of these things are very 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 important so i do think that there's a sense in which it's not only about like well that person is trained in that particular modality but also like that person you know both through their own personal experience of life but also through a kind of like a broader education they're able to enrich my worldview or my perspective of my worldview or to use metaphor and different examples to kind of like get that point across so that's kind of like the basic thing of it but yes within that there's also certain things that can be very helpful for specific things like you said right like the trauma thing for example um you know using psychedelics to help people through trauma is one way of using psychedelics that is well suited for a particular kind of person that is going through a particular kind of experience they're seeking a particular kind of treatment for something that they're suffering from uh that's not necessarily what you would do with every person like not every person wants to eat five grams of mushrooms and then be guided through somatic practice to try and locate the source of i mean that that might might make sense to a lot of people and it might mean nothing or be really annoying to a lot of other people right like you want to i mean unless you're hyper specialized and why way of doing things you want to be able to kind of like match your own approach and your own toolkit and your own skill set to what it is that the actual person is actually needing or asking from you uh, I'm trained in, uh, one of my teachers is Gabor Mate, right? So I, I, I'm a graduate of his psychotherapeutic program and I, I don't use it always. I actually don't use it very often either, but I do use it sometimes, right? Like I know that sometimes, you know, when I'm, when I'm working with somebody who I feel that particular approach is appropriate and can be beneficial for sure is great you know like like allowing people to tap into their bodies and connect with the sensations and then uh unfold what is the actual subjective experience of that physical sensation and make connections between that experience and childhood experiences and uncovering where the belief systems that emerge from those early childhood experiences and then making the connection between the belief system and the way that they react to things in the present i mean it's simple but it's incredibly useful for some people and this is i think maybe the key you know, for some people so you know i think you know it's like like abraham maslow uh famous dictum right like the law of the instrument if you're only if your only instrument is a hammer then everything is going to start looking as a nail and i think it's very dangerous when we're doing the kind of work that we do and everything and everyone is a nail because we can't hammer down everything we need to be able to know which tools and which approaches and which skills are appropriate for each situation uh where when we do need to hammer some nail down then we do that but sometimes it's much more complex than that something is different sometimes it requires a different perspective sometimes it requires a different metaphor a different recommendation right like there's all sorts of different things that are useful so, you know, to answer your original question, I think in a very broad sense, yeah, it's great to integrate all sorts of different perspectives, including different, you know, ontological systems, right? And epistemic, and epistemic systems. I mean, I very much like the Amazonian uh, way of working with ayahuasca. I dieted myself uh, years. I, I, I did very long paths including dieting of plants i have a lot of respect and admiration for the singing part of it the caros the subtleties of the energetic work that you know amazonian onayas shipibo onayas and other mestizos and different <laughs> nations in the amazon their understanding of frequency and vibration and patterning in the body and I mean, honestly, these are things that are way, way, way beyond both my skill set and my understanding. Yeah, like I can grasp to some extent, but you know, and I, yeah, but but I, I mean, I I do have you know outside of that particular skill or that particular energetic part, the, the ontology behind the system, right? Like the the animistic aspect of understanding the world in a particular way, of understanding human illness, not as something that happens in a vacuum, but something that emerges out of uh, infringing a norm of reciprocity between that person and their environment, right? Like, like in the Amazon rainforest, like nobody get sick just because they get sick any illness every and any illness that a person comes with 
uh, will be diagnosed in relationship to something external to them or at least relational, right? Like another person may be sick or a tree or a plant or a thing or the environment. Like there was an infringement in something that is rooted in reciprocity and mutual responsibility. And the treatment is accordingly, right? It's not an individualized treatment that you become a passive consumer or whatever is being held. It's a reparation of a relationship that will make you feel better. Right? Like your healing inherently entails the reparation of a relationship that was damaged or broken because you infringed in one of these rules of reciprocity. So that way of understanding what illness means, for example, speaks a lot to me, right? But at the same time, right? Like if somebody, I mean, I'm not going to impose that way of looking at things in the same way that other facilitators would because they're very, very attached to a plant spirit caricature of Amazonian ontologies. It's oh, like, well, you know, this is happening because you... Uh, ate something that you weren't supposed to eat in your diet and now like the plant is mad at you and she's angry and hence you know you're having this horrible disease because you deserve it because you didn't keep your word and the reciprocity okay that's not a good thing to tell somebody right oh like the you know the plant is now angry at you and she's gonna make you ill and there's all sorts of different ways in which we can be inspired by a particular worldview. Yeah, but also like having the skill and the sensibility to translate that in a way that first of all, doesn't cause yetrogenic harm. I mean, yetrogenic harm is uh, again, like going back to that thing we were talking about, like that's the sense that sometimes a lot of the harm actually happens from a medical perspective or initiated by bad medical practices. So iatrogenic harm happens a lot in facilitation, right? Like we're installing, we're installing a program or planting a seed or saying something that perhaps, um, and I, I know that I already said this, but I just, this is something that I always go back to because I have to, I have had to deal with this often, right? Like people that are now in a constant state of panic or anxiety because they feel that they're haunted by a spirit of some plant that they infringed some diet and now they're broken and irreparably damaged forever. And when you trace that to their actual root source, oftentimes you will trace that back not to an actual ontological, metaphysical reality that is happening, but uh, to a very harmful, damaging story that somebody, another person, another Western person, more often than not, put in their heads and it took root and it grew into this whole psychotic or neurotic uh, belief system. So... Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it is very important to have a broad skill set and a broad understanding and being able to integrate different things. But that also requires a certain degree of responsibility to actually understand that the ontology that you're trying to communicate, um, that you actually understand that in a good enough way, right? That you're not that you're not uh, uh, just regurgitating some sort of marketing-based caricature that is used mostly to attract naive people to a particular way of doing things, right? I mean, you go into like the websites of retreat centers in the Amazon and they're all absurd. I mean, not all of them, but the majority of them are really absurd, right? Like, oh, like you're going to come and diet with Mamacita Bovinsana. And Mamacita Bovinsana is a beautiful plant that will give you ABCD and she and she will give you the gift of DBCT. And, uh, you know, like this kind of like a catalog, like a like, like an Amway catalog or a Sears catalog of like, oh, like these are the plants that you can diet and these are the things that these plants will gift you and you know they look like this and so i mean okay a grain of salt let's say it's always necessary and welcome when dealing with these kinds of things but you know the point being if you really want to expose somebody to ideas that belong to a different worldview that belong to a different culture that come from a radically different ontology then at the very least like fucking make sure that you yourself understand them minimally well that you can actually transmit them without damaging that person's perception of what that actually means right like it's that's, that's kind of like the basic thing same goes for philosophical ideas right or concepts whether right? like you wanna you wanna say like hey maybe in this case it would be good if we manage to give this person the opportunity to break free from the prisons of material scientism and maybe there's new concept that can help and you know this is you know like let's say like you wanna you wanna you wanna recommend that this person reads 
um, something about idealism or some sort of understanding, you know, like some, I don't know, theories in the philosophy of mind that are more embodied or you know, whatever. Um, you know, like it, it would be good if the person doing that actually knew what they were talking about, as opposed to just kind of giving a half-assed explanation of something that they haven't fully digested themselves. So, you know, in that sense, I think it is very important to have like a broad scope of ideas, metaphors, examples, ideologies, cultures, practices, and so on and so forth. But as long as we actually know and can embody the things that we're saying, that we're recommending, or at least explain them minimally well. But like, I mean, half of the things that I said, by the way, are the things that I myself don't, I couldn't explain minimally well, so I wouldn't go there. But that's just, just the examples that I'm giving. Um, and you know, within Western Western things, or like let let's say like things that emerge more from a Western understanding of what the mind is, then yeah, of course. I mean, there's a lots of like lots of really important and interesting and useful somatic approaches and trauma informed things, and even even cognitive behavioral therapy can be useful in some cases. Um, and you know. Even the, you know, when we get like even pharmacology is incredible sometimes. I mean, I'm not opposed to pharmaco- pharma, um, psychopharmaceuticals. I think we have incredible tools that are very important sedatives and antipsychotics and also anxiolytics and things that can really relieve a person's suffering and can be lifesavers in many cases. And I think it's just a matter of like really knowing when and what. And what can be appropriate in each situation, so we're not causing iatrogenic harm, but at the same time that we are, you know, allowing the person to um, come up with their own sense making and world of meaning, facilitated maybe by a person that has a broad understanding of different ways of doing that. Yeah, I think a lot of what you're saying is first and foremost for people to be try to be more aware of where their beliefs are coming from, what the belief is, instead of it just being like unconscious in the back of the head and having these frameworks and not realizing where it, where it came from and not looking at it and not understanding it on a deeper level. And I think we all have kind of this tendency to quickly pick up beliefs and frameworks and things and start using them before we really understand them or even knowing where we picked it up. Yeah. So that's, I think that's definitely a helpful framing. Um, I have this one question that this is something I've been thinking about. And um, what do you think about uh, the amount of time somebody uses psychedelics and like the frequency of it? Like, do you think that over time there's a diminishing return on investment? Like there's less positive things coming from it. Whereas like I, I just know for me, like when I, for me these experiences were always so profound so i couldn't like just keep doing them and doing them like every month and i couldn't do them a lot and now i've kind of it's been almost two years since i've even had a psychedelic experience and i actually feel really like happy with where i'm at right now after blowing everything apart and then over the years putting things together and reintegrating and for me the integration process has been very challenging like especially around 5-MeO DMT, um, you know, because it's very like ego dissolution and just this immense experience where it's like, where do I fit this in to the context of my life? Um, but then I just see that it's like people keep returning to the well. And like my intuition is like, if you keep returning to the well, it's like you're missing. Uh, it seems like there's, you know, something, the message is not being transmitted. You're not getting it. Um, so I'm, I'm just wondering what your take is on that. Like through your experience, do you feel like sometimes you see people, they keep coming back and coming back and coming back and it's like, Hey, maybe the answer is not here. Maybe the answer is somewhere else. Yeah. I mean, this is a, again, this is a tricky thing to answer. I think there's personal experiences. Uh, and I think like one of the, one of the variables that I think is important to actually touch on is, uh, what is the approach or why, why is the reason that people do psychedelics? Yeah, because I think that's that can vary a lot. For example, uh, we currently are on a wave of hyper medicalization and instrumental instrumentalization of psychedelics. Like psychedelics have to be used with a purpose, right? Like we have kind of this narrative going around that the only positive use of psychedelics or the only reasonable use of these substances is for personal healing and for personal growth. And it's very utilitarian in that sense, right? Like there's always something that you want to get out of it that is contributing something 
um, to your personal development, to your personal process, to your career, to something. And in that sense, I do think that psychedelics are useful, but they're very limited, particularly because exactly what you said, like if you if you keep going to it uh, uh, instead of like actually applying the the insights and the things that you see and that you learn through those experiences, then it can become just another distraction uh, or at the very least just, you know, diminishing returns is a good way to putting it. So there's, you know, there's, there's, there is, I mean, I, I, I do connect with what you said also, like for me, it was, it has also been a similar trajectory, right? Like, I mean, I spent many years in the jungle and because of the environment that I was in, because of the free, of the availability of it, the social expectations that were placed on people that were working there. I did find myself drinking ayahuasca, for example, way more often than I would feel comfortable with. I didn't know that at the time. You know, it felt there was a little, some sort of like social pressure. There was an expectation, like you need to perform a certain way. As, uh, but, you know, I have had zero inclination to go back to it since I left. Like I have no desire whatsoever. I mean, I, I, I imagine at some point I will drink ayahuasca again, uh, but I, I feel really saturated with it. I don't feel that I need it. I don't feel that it was giving me anything in the last stretch that I was there. I think it was a wonderful ally for a while. I did learn beautiful things, uh, but at some point it also just became pretty flat. And it's not because I wasn't advancing in the present because like, again, like there's, 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 there's a glass ceiling to how much can we get out of those experiences um, depending on what is the orientation. Nowadays, I do think that the one thing that medicalization and professionalization has done to psychedelics in many ways is a growing disdain and a growing rejection of the recreational, which in my view is one of the greatest tragedies of this process because the recreational in my view is actually the first and foremost primary uh, way in which we can benefit from these things you know like the again this is a controversial statement nowadays but you know like people that have for decades before these things became hyper medicalized like just enjoy eating mushrooms with their friends in the forest and tripping out in their living room and dropping acid in the music festival and dancing for 24 hours to the best music that you know they like and finding that sense of radical joy um, and radical communion with the people that they love in the dance floor and just like the sheer levels of joy and fun that you can reach in those states. I mean, uh, I think those are the things that are worth maybe doing sporadically, but more frequently in terms of like, not necessarily like, um, you know, the therapeutic hyperclinical aspect of it, but just like the sheer reminder of how beautiful things can be. But right? the sheer reminder that we can have fun no matter how busy we are or no matter how old we are, that we can step out of our day-to-day -day consciousness and spend three weeks in a festival and, you know, eat some drugs and drink a little bit and hang out with our friends and enjoy the shit out of life for three days and have a blast and then go back to life. And, you know, like these are, these are the experiences I think that, really are the bread and butter of these things more so than the hyperclinical, you know, only within the context of therapy, so on and so forth. I mean, MDMA is great for therapy. It's great for PTSD. It's great for couples. Um, what is so great also as a aid, as a, you know, Berg for a weekend out with your best friends and the sheer connection and the thing that you can, you know, like that, like that aspect is nowadays I feel grossly understated and sometimes even disdained. And I think that's a huge mistake. Like the fun, the joy, the connection, the non medicalized, non institutionalized, non gatekept part of why these things became popular to begin with. Um, you know, that's something that I I would always go back to. I mean, I'm, I don't think I'm going to drink ayahuasca forever or, you know, do drugs therapeutically forever or use substances as a vehicle for personal growth forever. I don't think that I need that forever. 
but I would definitely always be happy to once a year or once every six months, like go and dance my ass off in a festival or a party with my best friends and eat some molly. So, you know, I think there's, I think like what I want to say, there's, there's, there's so many different uses and so many different ways in which these tools and substances can be beneficial for people. Um, you know, really just remembering that we need to keep broadening our scope uh, of why these tools are powerful in all sorts of different ways and not pigeonhole them into like, oh, like this is the only useful way or this is like the only, you know, legal way or, this is, you know, I think this is, this is a real risk that we're facing nowadays. Yeah, so psychedelics are not just for healing, but psychedelics are also for playing. For I think primarily, primarily, first and foremost, they're for playing, and a lot of the healing comes from playing. So I think that's that's the that in my in my view that is the structure of things. Yeah, like they are for healing, but that healing comes primarily through playing, primarily through connection with other people. They're also playing primarily through remembering, right? Like that that connection exists. And sometimes also through the insights and the intra-psychic things that happen in terms of like memories and trauma and processing things and so on and so forth and metaphysical awakenings. First and foremost, primarily, I think the majority of the healing is relational and is based on playfulness. Yeah, I think this is an important point and definitely um, something that probably has not been echoed, like the recreation, recreational use has been kind of condemned by a lot of uh plant medicine communities and healing communities. And I, I think also for me, I got so into using, like I would call it conscious psychedelic use where it's like, you have to have an intention, you have to have a purpose. Um, and I definitely, now I definitely more so agree with this point that it, who's to say, like who's to say that um, that experience that you're gonna take some mushrooms with your friends in, in nature and just hang out. And it's not about diving deep into your trauma, but just kind of, uh, being in the moment with others and and appreciating the beauty of life and it ends up being just as healing if not more healing without the hyper intentionality of it uh, definitely i think that's an important point to take away um yeah this has been an amazing conversation adam about mental health psychedelics uh society culture i'm curious is there anything you wish that i would have asked you that i didn't or is there anything else you would like to share uh, before we wrap up no, I think this was this was comprehensive, and you know, I think again, like most of the most of the points that I oftentimes want to put across, really are just about that shifting that perception from what it means to be happy and healthy. You know, it's not necessarily kind of like that hyper individualistic perception, but something that's more relational. Yeah, you know, like to illuminate and visibilize the intrinsic links between the health of individuals and the health of their communities and the health of their societies and the health of the culture that uh, envelops our experiences and the health of our ecosystems and environments that nourish us, um, you know, our life support systems and that all of these things that are intertwined. And then if you really want to understand in a broader and deeper level, the epidemics of loneliness and alienation and depression and anxiety and all the things that are ravaging, you know, Western societies, but mostly younger people and mostly chronically online younger people that we need to start looking at all of these factors, um, as well as start looking at individual people, but more, more so at the context, obviously, in which these lives are unfolding and what are the factors that are driving all of these epidemics of, um, emotional suffering and psychosocial disconnection and so on and so forth. Yeah, I appreciate that message and I appreciate your integrative perspective and looking at various lenses at, at mental health and at healing and, and psychedelics. Uh, thanks a lot, Adam. Appreciate yeah, you. Yeah, my pleasure. On. Thank you for having me. Take care.